What is happening y'all, Cowboy here and welcome to my starter guide for Horizon Forbidden West. Now while you don't need a starter guide to jump into this game, there are quite a few things that I wish I had known sooner when I was playing, and so the goal of this video is to bring all that information to you. Now since we're going to be looking at the map, there will be a couple minor spoilers, like you might see the location of a town or an icon for a machine you don't recognize. Uh, towards the end of the video, in terms of more major spoilers, I do want to discuss the location of one of the cauldrons and what that cauldron can unlock for you, in addition to some exploration-related items that are unlocked via the story. But before we get into those, I will give ample warning. So just to briefly go over everything we're going to be covering, uh, we're going to do a quick overview of map icons and things to look out for. Talk about item bar customization, merchants, money, some tips with the focus, uh, material hunting, the usefulness of skills, and a breakdown of you know what skills I found the most helpful. And then at the end, we'll get into those exploration items and the cauldron. So let's jump on into it. And the first thing we're going to do is pull on up our map. Now, looking at the map here, there's a couple of key icons I want to point out. Uh, the first being the workbench and the campfire. Now, campfires are super important because campfires allow you to freely fast travel around the game. If you don't have access to a campfire, you're going to have to have a fast travel pack, and these are purchased from the Hunter Merchant. They are 25 shards a pop, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's going to add up fast when you're fast traveling all over. So always keep your eyes out for campfires. The workbench is where you do all of your upgrades and crafting. So upgrading your weapons, upgrading your armor, upgrading your uh, item pouches, and also from the workbench, we are able to craft ammo cheaper with a certain perk. Now, the reason I want to point these two things out in particular is if we head out just a little bit to the west, here's a good one right here. These are called shelters. And shelters you're going to find throughout the map, and they are just like little safe zones, and they're going to always have a workbench, they're gonna have access to your stash, they are fast travel accessible because they have a fire, and there's also a little pad where you can rest at these to pass time. So as you explore out in the world, always keep an eye out for shelters, because you just have to briefly visit it, you just gotta like go by it and it's gonna be unlocked. And then that gives you not only a new fast travel point, but a spot where you could craft up upgrades in the middle of the wild, which I think is super useful. Uh, besides that, to point out some of the primary merchant icons, right here we have the Hunter. The Hunter is where you're going to buy almost all of your weapons throughout the game. There are a couple side quests that may give you weapons, and you can also get them from doing the, uh, the hunting trials as well as the arena battles. But the Hunter is your main go-to. Besides that, we have the Cook up here. Uh, food gives you buffs that last for like three to seven minutes in combat, depending on how many upgrades you have. Super useful. Stitcher, similar to the Ranger, except this is where you get all of your armor. And armor in this game is generally based around a playstyle, so you could find melee armor or stealth armor, or ranged armor, whatever the case is. So uh, every time you get to a new town, I would suggest seeking out both the Stitcher as well as the Hunter to see if there's new gear that you want. Over here we have the Herbalist, and Herbalists are super useful because you can not only buy healing potions, but you can also buy berries, the main consumable that we do use to heal throughout the game. Now besides that, there are merchants that will allow you to dye your armor, and merchants that will allow you to apply face paint, but they are way, way later in the game. Like I think the first one I remember finding is way up in like the snowy mountains, so you know, early on you're going to start finding berries to dye armor with, or you'll find face paints, and you'll be like, where are these dudes? And just know they're they're, they're a lot later, like in particular, uh, I want to say the first one I found was, they were like somewhere all the way out here, I think. Yeah, there, there's a painter guy, and then I think there might also be a, uh, yeah, there's a dyer. These are the first two I ended up encountering in the game, so definitely kind of rare, as you can see, just how far we went uh, to get over to those guys. But wanted to put that out there because I've had friends that are also reviewing the game be like, where do I get face paint? And I'm like, well, it's kind of far. Uh, besides that, the other map icons are kind of self-explanatory. You know, like over here we can fight chargers. Over there we can fight scroungers. And I'll leave you to discover the rest of that. Uh, but we can pull up filters at any time. And we can turn off particular stuff. So if you only want to hunt machines, you pop that. And now the only thing that will be on the map are machine icons. And if you have particular quests, those quests will also still be on the map. Put these all back on. Uh, to talk about two of the merchants in particular a little bit more in depth, as I already mentioned, the herbalist is super useful, and I cannot stress this enough. I didn't start doing this until late game, but as we take damage, we can use berries to heal. We can pick berries in the wild, and you can actually load up way more. You can have more than 14. If you hold the D-pad up, you'll refill your berries. And going to the herbalist and resources, we can pick up these medicinal berries. 
and they only cost one shard a pop, so I would always suggest running by and stocking up on berries before you head out into the wild. If I find something, I now have 42 different heals available that I can blow through, and trust me when I say you will use those heals. Right, going on down there, we're gonna go over to the hunter, which by the way, this thing I have, the, uh, the glider that they showed off in the trailers, you get that super, super early in the game. Uh, this area right here is known as the Daunt. It's kind of like you're connecting the first game to the Forbidden West. Uh, and this town right here is Barren Light. As soon as we leave Barren Light and start doing things over here, there's like, you know, it's story progression, you'll get your glider. So, you know, very, very early, you're going to get access to it. Hopping on over to the Hunter. As I mentioned, we have weapons here. And one of the big things I want to point out are job creations. Now, let's say you wanted uh, this thing, Slicing Shredder Gauntlet, but it's 462 shards. You don't have that at the start. You don't have the Leap Slash Circulator. You can hit Triangle to create job, and this will create basically a quest that'll track that you need a Leap Slash Circulator and 467 shards, and it'll mark where this merchant is on the map for you. So super useful feature because there were a couple weapons early on that I was like, man, that's cool, but I don't have the money for it. And then I forgot what merchant had those. So if you ever see something that you want, but you can't afford, create a job with it and then you'll be able to find it. Uh, as I mentioned, you also have the fast travel packs for sale here. I would suggest in general to have about five or 10, because as you can see, if you're like, oh, I'm gonna max out at 50, that's expensive. I mean, early on in the game, 1100 shards, you're gonna go broke. So five to 10 is more than enough and just keep your eye out for campfires. Now, on the note of merchants, obviously, money is a big concern. And to be honest, one of the main ways that you're actually going to uh, get money is selling valuables. As you can see, I have a bunch of buyback that I've sold already. You know, bright bracelet, ancient chime, metal eye, sculpture. And just to, to buy a couple of these back to show the, the menu interface, these are items that are literally just to sell. When you go down to resources, they'll be right here at the top, and you can just mark them all up to sell with triangle and sell them all. Besides that, you can, of course, sell uh, extra machine parts. I like selling coils because, you know, I have no reason for four frost coils. So I think coils are also a decent choice to sell. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to be those valuables. Now, talking about those valuables, you can find those out in the world. I'm going to hop over to this campfire real fast and also take a, a brief look with the focus. So there's two particular things I want to point out cash wise. When we click our focus, you can see I have a couple of different icons popping up. And those are things that are already visible to us. If I was to hold my focus, this will allow us to scan more deeply so I can see things that aren't within my line of sight. Like, you know, there's oh, there's a, uh, you know, that's an herb over there that I could get. Over there, I can see a red fox if I was hunting those. Uh, so this is also super useful when you're hunting wildlife because it'll let you see stuff behind terrain. But when you're exploring a new area, you can pop this and you can see caches that are hidden behind walls. Now we have two types. We have the valuable cache, and these are always going to be useful. I don't care how small they are, because these are going to always have metal shards, and they're going to have things you can smell, uh, smell, things that you can sell for metal shards. And then over here, we have a supply cache. And supply caches are going to give you uh, things for cooking, things for upgrading, berries, and they're also going to give you some metal shards as well. So just keep your eyes out for those caches. Those are super useful, and you're just going to find them as you play the game. Now, in particular, I mentioned... Uh, material hunting and whatnot. Let's let's hop on out to. There's that shelter. Uh, we're gonna hop on out to the shelter just so we're closer to some wildlife. But when it comes to hunting, machine parts are obviously pretty self-explanatory. You know, we know how to get those. But one of the bigger things that I struggle with for a long time in the game was getting my pouch upgrades. Now the pouch involves you know more ammo, more bombs, more spikes, more resources, everything. But, you know, as you can see, it's all kinds of different things. This this thing needs iridescent crab shells and bass bones. This needs vulture wishbones and horde lizard skins. And for the longest time, I would just wander around. And I'm like, oh, I haven't seen a duck. I don't I don't know. I don't know where the ducks are or whatever. When I find one, I'll kill one. Uh, if you use triangle to create job, similar to tracking uh, how I showed before, and then we go here and we go under quests, it's going to detail out where to find those. Duck wishbones are harvested from ducks in dense jungles and coastal areas. Bighorn sheep are commonly found in cold mountainous areas. And it'll also mark it, so I can see over here, bighorn sheep. Now this isn't the only area with bighorn sheep, but it's one of the closest areas to me that have bighorn sheep. You can also see it's gonna go way out over there, and if I go over here, duck wishbone. So I know that there's gonna be ducks over there. So definitely, definitely use that. I did not realize that I could do that and track wildlife like that until very, very close to the end of the game. 
And honestly, it, it's a game changer because, you know, having access to being able to find and get those upgrades sooner, you know, be able to uh, carry more ammunition, more berries, more potions, all that stuff is going to be super useful in your journey throughout the Forbidden West. Now, this next part is going to be a bit a little bit lengthy because we are going to be talking about the skill tree and in particular, the skills that I found to be the most useful. So we have six distinct skill trees, each of them associated with a play style. Warrior is your melee stuff. Traps are for traps. Hunter is for ranged. Survivor is low health skills. Infiltrator is for stealth stuff. And the machine master, as you can probably guess, is for machines. And now going on into the warrior tree, I want to focus on key skills that I think you should pick up as well as a quick discussion of uh, the weapon arts or the weapon techniques that I would recommend being a priority. Uh, so first up, block breaker. This is a very easy combo, and this whole tree expands the melee combat greatly, but this is one of the very first ones I suggest getting, because being able to break an enemy's guard in melee combat is going to be invaluable, so definitely you're going to want to pick that up. Now, moving down from there, we're going to talk about the uh, three different warrior bow techniques. Now, we have spread shot. This does a widespread of five arrows, medium amount of stamina. Melee detonator, which puts arrows on a target, which can trigger an explosion for a small amount of stamina. And then we have Burst Fire, which is three arrows in a little bit tighter grouping for a small amount of stamina. Now, to be honest, the Warrior Bow isn't really that good for hunting machines. It can be great for fighting against humans because you don't have to, like, really... You don't have to draw it back like the other bows. You just quick shot it. Uh, in that regard, I found Burst Fire to be super nice for taking out some things like, uh, you know, mounts like rams or boars or stuff that were coming at you. Burst Fire had an, a, a tight enough grouping to take those out. I will say, uh, come on, get over there. Melee Detonator can actually be pretty nice in some cases against machines, even bigger machines, because it does a pretty nice explosion and that explosion can knock off a lot of parts, both armor and components, but it's definitely risky to use against bigger targets. Now, speaking of bigger targets, this is where spread shot can shine. And I will say it's a little bit janky because there were times where I would spread shot and I'd hit all five arrows on a weak point and do insane damage. Like I would just boom, 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 boom drill out 25 arrows in like three seconds and stuff would die and then there's other times where i would use it and it would just tickle whatever i was fighting so kind of situational but it can be potent uh, all in all if you're doing a lot of melee i think melee detonator is going to be your best bet followed by burst fire and then spread shot moving on into the trapper tree now the trapper tree has a, a bunch of different perks related to traps and elemental and whatnot in um, particular, there's only two upgrades here, and it's for the trip caster as well as the rope caster. But if you use those, these are both no-brainers. The rope caster will allow you to instantly fire out the rope and pin it down. We also have something new called rope canisters, where it has a elemental canister on it. And so you can use this to instantly fire that off. So if you have corrosive arrows and corrosive canisters, you fire the corrosive canister into the enemy, shoot it with a corrosive arrow, and boom, on-demand elemental explosion. And using penetrating rope, you can fire that off instantly for a medium amount of stamina. Uh, the trip caster with quick wire, that's very similar. You know, small amount of stamina just shoots them out so you don't have to manually shoot them. If you're using the trap quick, the yeah, trip caster, this is a no-brainer. Moving on into the hunter tree. Now, there are quite a few things in the hunter tree that I think are worth getting. Uh, this is the tree around hunter bows as well as bolt blasters. But we have something called Valor Surge Master here. And snaking on down to the bottom, we have it again. Now, Valor is your ultimate ability. Each tree is going to have different Valors. Some of them will give you super defense. Some of them will allow you to do a lot of damage. Some of them will make you invisible. Some of them will do an AoE that hits machines. Regardless of what Valor you pick and what your playstyle is, Valor Surge Master is a necessity, in my opinion. Uh, this is going to effectively double your Valor buildup, which is huge, and I cannot stress enough how useful it is. Another perk is going to be Workbench Expert. This is super, super useful. Uh, it's not going to completely eliminate the cost, but it cuts roughly a third of the cost off when crafting. And it's usually on the higher end stuff. Like if I'm making blast lances or blast spikes and I need like nine of a resource with this, I'm only going to need three of the blast resource to make it. So, you know, using this along with the uh, little, little settlements that we found in the workbenches, you can craft up all your stuff in the wild for a lot cheaper. And that's super useful. Now, talking about the weapon skills, first up, we have High Volley. It's a fun skill, but it's kind of situational, so I don't really recommend it. Uh, moving down from there, though, we have Triple Notch, and this thing was my bread and butter for almost the entire game. Uh, it loads up three arrows of our currently selected type. Uh, I will say I don't think it works that well with Elemental. Like, I would rather 
just shoot out three frost arrows versus loading up three and letting it loose in one shot. I don't know if that's a bug, but for some reason, elemental damage seems to build up better with separate shots. But using your normal arrows, this thing becomes a component sniping machine because a part that might take two or three arrows to take off typically, well, you just load up three arrows, shoot, and boom, that part comes off. Uh, moving on down here, we have knockdown shot, and this can be really useful, but it's also situational. Um, knocking down an enemy allows you to get the critical strike on them, which is nice, but later, once you have access to cauldrons and you can override targets, you can use knockdown shot to force them down onto the ground to then override, and that can be really useful in combat, but like I said, dependent on those cauldrons, so kind of situational. Going on over here, we have the, the bolt blaster. Um... Spread Blast, to be honest, not really that good. Um, it's decent if you have elemental bolts to help apply status, but for the most part, I didn't find this that good. Uh, moving on down, Sustained Burst. Now, I will say this is super hard to use because it's basically like this game's version of Wyvern Fire. You're just going to do the entire clip of bolts. You can't move during it. Stuff can interrupt you. Uh, but this thing can destroy. If you get a machine electrified or frozen or you know, knock down and then you use this, you're gonna do a lot of damage really fast with it. So very potent ability, but fairly situational in its usage. Moving down from there, we have Ultra Shot, which is you know, Wyvern Snipe from Monster Hunter. Uh, just shoots out an explosive bolt. To be honest, I didn't find this to be that strong. There are a, a couple of explosion options in the game, like long range explosive type stuff throughout weapons. And this one just didn't really feel that powerful. Moving on into this tree, though, this is the survivalist tree. A um, couple different perks here I want to point out. Uh, potent medicine is really useful, as well as medicine capacity. This just allows you more berries to heal with. And as we get all the way down towards the bottom, we have plant forager. This will double your gathered resources. So uh, two berries instead of one, six twigs instead of three. It's just useful in general. And now as for the weapon skills here, we have a couple of different bomb skills. Uh, bouncing bomb... It's fun, but it's very hard to use this. So you have a maximum of three bounces, and the thing is, machines are gonna move. So actually getting this bomb to bounce the number of times to reach maximum damage while still hitting the target is definitely a skill shot. And unless the target's knocked down, it's not all that effective, I found. Now you're probably wondering, like, why is he talking about it if he doesn't have it? Um, in the arena, there's a couple quests where you're given a loadout, and so even the stuff I didn't pick up I didn't pick it up because I was able to test it in the arena and decide I didn't like it. In a similar fashion, not really a fan of burst dodge. Uh, this will jump you back and toss out a bunch of uh, a bunch of your bombs. And as you can see right here, it looks real satisfying. You're like, well, what do you mean it's not that good? Look at all those bombs going out. The thing is, when you jump back, unless you are like starting hugging the leg of a machine, most of the time, half of these are going to whiff. Uh, it can work on some of the, the bigger machines in the game. And when I say bigger, I mean like Thunderjaw tier stuff. But for the most part, I just found it to be really inconsistent. And it costs a large amount of stamina. For a large amount of stamina, there are way more things I'd rather do than uh, tossing out a bunch of my bombs. I will say a, uh, a benefit of, of this one. Uh, this one will use the currently selected type bomb. So you can use it to like throw out five corrosive bombs and easily build up status. Uh, whereas Bouncing Bomb right here, this is always going to be explosive. So early on, this is one of the only real damage-oriented techniques you have with the Blast Sling. But to be honest, the Blast Sling is more about elemental damage, in my opinion. Just from playing with it, it's, it's fantastic at triggering elemental status and not really for damage. Uh, Sticky Bomb is also decent with damage. What happens here is we throw stickies on a target. It'll automatically explode by the time you hit the third, and it does compound. Like, one will go off for about three, and then two will go off for seven, and then it hits like a thousand if you get the third on there. But, once again, this weapon isn't really that good when you look at it for damage. Now, I will say in my testing, I found that using elemental bombs, they seem to get more buildup with sticky bomb. So, whereas it would take uh, two corrosive bombs to corrode a target, one corrosive sticky bomb would corrode the target instantly. So I do think it's useful in that regard. I'm moving on over here to the other skills. We have the Shredder Gauntlet skills. Now the Shredder Gauntlet's a little bit weird because you charge on up this rip saw, you toss it out, and it'll come on back to you like a boomerang. And if you catch it, you can continue to spin it up and keep building up the power. Uh, triple Shredder is okay in that regard because at least the primary Shredder is going to come back and you can reuse it. As we go on down, Shredder Mine, this felt completely useless to me. 
Uh, I tried using it in the arena, and the shock buildup was absolutely just pathetic. It might be decent against like really small trash tier machines, like you see in the little clip there, but against anything that's medium to big, the buildup was not there. Like I just, I'd, I'd fire off three lightning arrows and have a target, whereas this, I'd have to keep the target in range of it for like 30 seconds. Uh, the last one we have is Power Shredder, which is going to use up three of your currently equipped shredders to throw it out like a bomb. Very similar to the Blast Bolt, I just don't feel this is that powerful. Uh, we have two explosive techniques coming up that are way better, but I mean, if you're only using the Shredder and the uh, Bolt Blaster for some reason, you know, those are your explosive options. Moving on info to the Infiltrator Tree, this is all your stealth stuff. Uh, in general, I mean, almost everything in this tree can be good, especially low profile. This is a good one to get early just because it'll allow you to get closer to machines for overrides and criticals. Same with people. Uh, in terms of perks, we have three different perks. We have Brace Shot, which will do a powerful explosive. And this one's actually really good. Uh, my experience using Brace Shot, Brace Shot was decimating. This thing is, is you're literally firing off a missile at the target. Uh, moving down from there, we have Focus Shot. Focus Shot also a really good skill this is a snipe from far enough away that you could pop off a component with a machine not even noticing you're there uh, lastly we have double notch which i mean you know it can be useful uh but most of the time if i'm using this bow i'm super far away and i'd rather just use a snipe so personally if you really want the sniper style focus shot is going to be great but definitely don't discount brace shot this thing does some meaty meaty damage moving on to our last tree with machine master couple skills here that are certainly worthwhile uh, the first being override subroutines now what's nice about this is when you override a machine by default it's kind of in a neutral state it'll like attack if it's attacked it might hit something nearby but the ai might not be that smart with override subroutines you can decide whether you want it to be defensive and just you know get out of there and follow you or keep it as a uh, aggressive machine in which case it'll just suddenly attack now the cool thing here is you can use override subroutines to get a machine that's mountable and make it aggressive. And then when you go into combat and you hop off of your mount, your mount will fight alongside of you like it's a, a hunter pet or something. So I found that to be super, super, super useful, uh, especially because you can you can get stuff, you know, like we can, uh, the Velociraptors, you can override those. And there's like fire ones and corrosive ones. So you can get a fire Velociraptor, ride it into combat, jump it off, and then it's lighting stuff on fire for you, which is super badass. Uh, talking about the perks for the, the spike thrower, propelled spike, this thing is nasty. You know, going to talk about explosive. That thing destroys lives. This is my favorite explosive perk. Um, I think my, my uh, spike thrower is stronger than my other weapons, so maybe that's why this one is so strong. But every time I use this, it just decimates. Uh, moving over here, spike trap, not too bad. I will say one of the big advantages of this is most of the time, if it's a bigger machine and it's charging towards you, the spike trap will do enough uh, explosive potential to stagger that target and knock them back. So I did find it really good in that regard because other traps, sometimes they would blow them back. Sometimes they would trip the trap and the status wouldn't go off or, you know, it wouldn't be enough buildup. Spike trap consistently would stagger targets. So decent in that regard. Uh, and then splitting spike, very situational, but also very deadly with the right aim. Uh, this will split your spike into multiple projectiles, and it depends on the weapon spike you have. So if you have an explosive spike or a fire spike or whatever the case is, you're going to get multiple explosions or multiple fire spikes. So with a little bit of prep or a knockdown monster, this can do a lot of damage. Uh, definitely one that I don't think should be overlooked at all. Uh, but other than that, uh, the lasting override perk, that one's not bad. I think that covers the majority of like the, yeah, you definitely want these. So moving on from there, uh, we're going to be talking about some exploration based items. Now, these are the things that you get as you play the story that are needed for progressions past certain points. And in addition, they're usually needed when you're exploring ruins and whatnot to get through certain rooms. So I'm not going to discuss uh, what mission in particular you need to get these but i am going to give an idea of how far through the story so if you want to discover that on your own as well as the cauldron now would be the time to leave all right giving those people a couple seconds jumping on into it special gear first up the pull caster you get this at the start of the game can't miss it it's given to you via the story moving on from there the igniter now the igniter you get on like your second or third main story mission uh basically right after you leave uh, 
bulwark. Let me just let me show it to you on the map. Right after we, we leave Baron Light and we start heading on out. Uh, where did it go? Not Deadfalls, not Hollow Rock. Anyway, you leave that area and you start heading on west and you're going to have a quest that'll allow you to get that. So, point is, it's another very early item. And this is used to clear like the red coral called Fire Gleam that you'll see throughout the map. So, rest assured, if you're seeing some of that at the start, just continue the main story quest for maybe like an hour or two and you'll be able to get past it. The Diving Mask, on the other hand, this is pretty far into the story. Uh, now the story at one point is going to split into three parts where it's like, hey, you can do whatever you want, go to A, B, or C. Uh, one of those options of A, B, and C will be the desert. And if you decide to go do the desert area, you're gonna get the diving mask. And this is definitely useful to get because it'll allow you to stay underwater indefinitely and breathe as, as long as you're under there. So highly recommend it. The last one is the vine cutter. Now you'll see these large uh, kind of cylindrical metallic flowers and there's metal vines coming off of them. You need the vine cutter to get through that, but unfortunately you get this super, super late into the game. Uh, this was like four or five missions before the final mission of the game. So honestly, I would suggest just not even worrying about those flowers until you are super late because it's gonna take a hot minute to get a hold of the vine cutter. Uh, now with that out of the way, the last thing I want to discuss is one particular cauldron and that is way out here. There it is. This is Cauldron Iota. Now the reason Cauldron Iota is so important is because it has a tall neck that's in that cauldron and that tall neck isn't visible on the map. You can find the cauldron, but until you complete that cauldron, you won't get the tall neck that unveils all that stuff. Whereas the other tall necks you'll see on the map. So very important one, not only because you get the tall neck, but also because it has one machine in particular that we really want access to. And that is the Claw Strider. Now the Claw Strider is the new mechanical Velociraptor thing that we've been seeing in all of the trailers. Uh, it has a couple different variants and you can mount three of them. We have the regular one with the bladed tail. We have the fire one, which shoots out little fire bombs from its tail. And then the acid one, which shoots out acid bombs from its tail. Besides that, there's the apex variants and you can't override those, but you can get these and not only can you override them, but you can mount them which is fantastic because it means we can, like I said, use override subroutines to make it aggressive, ride it into combat, and then we either have an acidic or a fire-based mechanical velociraptor that's fighting battles with us. And that has been super helpful. Like outside of it having it try to fight like a thunder draw on its own, this thing will hold its own and it'll mess up most machines and it'll protect you. So definitely highly recommend it because besides that and as far as i know i think there's only uh three separate things that you can mount at least from what i found we have the charger you get these things super early you know it's a ram it's not bad uh we have the claw strider of course and then the last one are the bristlebacks now these come from the tau override the tau override is story related and these guys seem kind of cool you know there's fire bristlebacks um there's acid bristlebacks but for the most part these guys would get clapped uh, like when I see bristlebacks, I shoot and they are dead. So yeah, it, it's cooler than the Ram, but trust me when I say that you're gonna wanna get yourself a Claw Strider. The Claw Strider is, that's the ideal mount. Um, the other late games, you can't mount those guys, unfortunately, but Claw Strider is definitely worth it. Just to, God, that thing is so loud. Let me go over here. We'll um, wanna find an area. We'll show you the Claw Strider in combat. We got some scroungers here, let's go. We'll show him in combat in the we wrap up. I mean, they're scroungers, so they're gonna get absolutely decimated. But just to give an idea of what you can do with that override potential thing. Uh, another thing, and this is more useful, but if we go to settings and down in controls, auto sprint on mount, I found that really, really late into the game, but that's super nice. It's where you don't gotta worry about clicking the button to, to mount it all. It's just as soon as you're on your mount, it's running at the, the speed it can run. It doesn't get stuck on trees. Come on, big boy, let's go. Let's go. Where are those claw striders at? They're down. I know it doesn't look like this guy's going that fast, but it's just he has a big gate. He's actually, he's pretty quick. And we got some machines. We're gonna jump off. Go get him. Look at him go. Instantly, he's like, you dare challenge my master? And he'll just beat ass for us. That thing's dead. 
And I mean, on top of, you know, even if you're not like, oh, I need him to do the fight for me, it's nice because, you know, if you're sitting there and you're playing and then suddenly you're like, ooh, I think I want to go get a sandwich. Guess what? Little homie right here, he's going to keep you alive. He's going to protect you. Uh, now, the last tip I want to give is, as you can see, if he gets injured, you have to repair. And repair will add up. It doesn't seem like a lot, but you can rapidly blow through hundreds of metal shards to repair your mount. If you fast travel a moderate distance, like if I were to just go from here to the town, just doing that would be far enough that it would fully repair the mount. Uh, outside of repairing, if it just completely goes down, of course, you can always just override another one, and then that'll be that. But either way, that is going to wrap things up for me. So a lot of information I need to drink because I can tell my throat is completely dry. But hopefully this helps some of y'all on your journey. Uh, I mean, it's an absolutely fantastic game. I'm pretty sure I'm past the 50 hour mark at this point, uh, and I'm still having fun playing it. So definitely look forward to it and have a blast out there in the Forbidden West.